group them. Welcome to the Ambulatory Healthcare Today podcast, hosted by the Next Gen Advisors. Accelerate your success with insights from a multidisciplinary team of healthcare experts as they discuss an array of topics. These timely discussions can help you better navigate the challenges of running your ambulatory care practice. Here is your host. Hello, this is Graham Brown, Senior Vice President with NextGen Healthcare. I'm pleased to be joined today by a special guest, Dr. Roy Gill, Director of Clinical Informatics and Patient Safety with NextGen Healthcare. Today, we're going to discuss the growth, needs, and value of integrating dashboard capabilities into clinical practice. Welcome, Dr. Gill. Thank you. Before we delve into our topic today, perhaps you could begin by telling us a little bit about yourself and your career. Sure. Thanks very much. So I'm a family physician. I started practice back in 1990. I trained in Pennsylvania. And um, I did a couple of different practices for a while. I was kind of following my wife around in her career. And in the late 90s, I worked for uh, Geisinger Health System, a large healthcare system in rural Pennsylvania. And they started doing this weird thing. They were adopting an electronic health record. It's a very large healthcare system. And I just got involved in the project and gradually began to really enjoy clinical informatics and the way we could use computers to help individual providers, patients, and populations. It was all new back then. So I just got involved more and more in the EHR project to the point where for the past uh, 12 to 15 years, I've been doing only clinical informatics. I've been here at NextGen for 13 years, first starting to work with our clients, the physicians doing implementation and EHR optimization. And now I work more with the R&D teams to work with the clinical content and workflows that go into our product. I also uh, became interested in patient safety and became the patient safety officer here at uh, our company. Excellent. Well, that's great. So you have a really perfect background for today's topic. So let's get into it. Um, Maybe at a high level, let's start with kind of the value of dashboards overall in, in clinical practice. Sure. Well, first to get on the same page, I'd like to take a couple of seconds to define a dashboard as we're talking about them. So there was one nice definition I read in an article in the International Journal of Medical Informatics, and that definition is that clinical dashboards are interactive data visualization tools that provide a visual summary of decision-related clinical information displayed in graphs, charts, or interactive tables. So you'll see a kind of a theme there with regards to visualization. Now, granted that we intuitively kind of know what dashboards are, but this gets us all together on the same page. Now, in a study back in 2018, they found that 54% of doctors believe that EHRs have a negative impact on physician-patient relationships, and 60 51% believe that EHRs have a negative impact on efficiency and productivity. So that's kind of the opposite of what we were shooting for back in the 90s when we were instituting EHRs. Those numbers go up and down, and there's lots of information about time spent in EHRs. There was one study that showed uh, 16 minutes of EHR documentation time per patient, or more than half the day spent in EHRs, that kind of thing. So we find that that you know, we're not fulfilling the dream here. A large part of the burden, we talk about physician burden, is just figuring out what's going on with the patient. How are all of their chronic conditions doing? In the great ocean of data, the test data, the patient anthropometrics, their measurements, the questionnaires that the patients are doing, their medications and all of that, am I missing anything? It's a big question. It bothers docs all the time. And in most cases, all of these pieces of data are in vastly different places in the EHR. It's easy to miss stuff. And that leads one to have to look at multiple screens, remember things from one screen to the next, and then distill all of that into a profile of some sort about the patient. The problem then is that the EHR storing data, but it's not helping us with the information with those insights. That's still all kind of left to the doctor to figure out what's going on. So that's where dashboards come in. Well-designed dashboards, we'll talk a little bit more about that later, can, behind the scenes, collate all the pertinent data, perform some analytics, and present to the physician 
a profile or a summary of the patient's status with regards to a single or a set of conditions, or perhaps even an overall health profile. Dashboards can then show what's getting better, what's worse, uh, what the patients do for, what they're overdue for, what information requires immediate attention, and what might be able to be handled by um, other staff maybe, either later or um, other team members. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm sure we'll, we'll get into this. Sounds like there's actually probably a number of different types of dashboards that clinicians could consider. Talk a little bit about some of the ones that are being used. Well, unfortunately, in all too many cases, none is the right answer. Dashboards are just hard. I mean, it's just that, that, that simple. They're hard to do, so they're often not done at all. But to answer the question maybe a little bit better, there's some more simple models out there, even a relatively simple screen showing, say, the progress of labs of a patient with diabetes and maybe compare that with their weight or their calorie intake and showing if there's tests or vaccines overdue. All of that in kind of one consolidated view, and that's not a lot of information. That would be a type of a dashboard that some EHRs are already using and some other connected software might already have that uh, the physician has in their armamentarium. But there's also some progress to much more comprehensive information. There was an article uh, regarding visual analytics, which is a buzzword I learned recently, um, in the American Journal of Hypertension. So not necessarily informatics focused, but they talked about a dashboard with regards to that field. And they studied a hypertension dashboard showing not only ideas similar to what I talked about a few minutes ago, but also added some items like uh, social determinants of health risks, associated medications, cardiovascular risk, recommendations for medications that might have been figured out by some algorithm. And they're all displaying there on, on one consolidated view in that study in that journal. Mm -hmm. So interesting. Um, what it makes me think is that, you know, clinicians are one type of user. You spoke a little bit about whether, you know, other members of the care team can take up tasks that the physician or the primary clinician doesn't need to undertake. But it makes me think about what are the elements that might be relevant in a dashboard at different levels for different audiences, maybe at the practice level, at the site level or at that provider level, or to your point at the patient level, what, what information do I need to know right today as I'm interacting with this individual, this client? Yeah, boy, uh, breaking it down that way is really interesting. There's lots of cool stuff to talk about there on all those different levels. And I'm really glad you brought up that, that patient level. I really want to talk about that because that's what it's all about in the end. But I think it'll be good to start at those high levels and work our way kind of down. So um, you were first talking about things like the practice level and the provider level. So a lot of practices have maybe a care manager or someone like that that really does tend to look kind of across the board um, or even the providers. And they would have dashboards that help identify looking across a practice or across maybe the physician's patient body of work uh, and looking at the care opportunities among the patient group. So for instance, they might look across all of the patients with diabetes and they can see what risk or gaps in care those patients have. They might look at just the diabetic patients who are usually uh, having a restricted things of what types of health maintenance types of things that they need and look and see what those patients are due for or overdue for. But just as with during a physician encounter, it's often more complicated than that. Um, there's other factors to consider than just those single pieces of data. So the care manager would look for a more coalesced view that would include other longitudinal data so that they can really assess the risk for those patients. They would look at other information that would help the caregiver triage the work better and make more informed decisions. We don't have infinite resources, so we have to kind of grade who we're going to um, pay the most attention to at any given time. And then we also think about performance and overall quality type of information. So that's something else that would be looked at across a whole practice or even a whole healthcare system. How does a practice or provider compare to national benchmarks, local benchmarks, benchmarks uh, for maybe a, a payer or um, an ACO or something like that? What trends are being seen and why? 
by identifying those things, practices can learn what works well, what's working poorly, and they can plan interventions to improve overall care. So that's kind of another view that these dashboards can give us. And then also looking at the practice and provider level, we can go outside maybe some of the clinical information and look at dashboards that don't necessarily look at outcomes, but they look more at the EHR usage data because that, that gives us a different set of information. Are the healthcare workers spending too much time in their EHR? Is there too much pajama time or time at home being spent? Are they not timely with things like reviewing labs, answering messages, and uh, doing their documentation? And if so, what interventions might help? So by looking at how we're using the HR, we're addressing physician burnout. We're addressing, in the end, outcomes because we know we want to do things better and faster to be able to take care of the patients. So that's kind of the, 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 the high level out there. And then when we're talking about just the, the kind of the patient provider level, there's always going to be, again, some sort of longitudinal view or at least a longitudinal analysis. So we talked a lot about visuals before, but you know things like line graphs, maybe you can visualize some of that. But you might not need fancy graphics. The dashboard really just kind of needs to show you also some sort of summary, a longitudinal analysis. So think about the computer doing stuff behind the scenes and analyzing those trend lines and saying, the patient's hemoglobin A1C, a marker for diabetes, has decreased by two points, and that's at goal. I don't need to necessarily see the line. I just see the information. So there's a dashboard behind that, but that bit of information is really giving me a lot of good care information. Maybe that's enough. Um, some sort of trending is almost always helpful uh, if it's applicable like in some of those chronic diseases. And then, of course, as uh, we said, comparison with the status of how the condition is doing with some sort of guideline, a national guideline with what should be going on with the patient, um, outstanding items and so forth. And then on the patient level, and I'm getting so happy we talked about that, dashboards can help patients too. So while we're looking at a different view, maybe than what the provider or the care manager is looking at, Imagine you're a patient and you're logging into your patient portal and you see you see how your hemoglobin A1C is trending with your weight and how it's trending with your uh, food consumption and how maybe it changed when your doctor changed your diabetes med three months ago and looking at maybe your carb intake and things like that. Just having that patient view and them being able to update it, they don't need a lot of fancy definitions and all that kind of stuff, they will have this great visual picture of how they're doing and they don't have to talk to their doctor um, to get that information. And they are really empowered then to be able to do much more self-care. So I think lots of different applications across the board. Mm -hmm. So help our listeners maybe bring those two elements together in terms of that patient view, that provider view. Talk a little bit about how dashboard data might best be incorporated at that point of care, um, in that cl you know the clinician's workflow, they're they're getting ready to meet with a patient. What kind of information might they need then? Yeah, so and that can start even um, before the patient is seen. So I definitely want to talk about what's going on in the exam room. But back when I was actually seeing patients, and and I think it's very common in a lot of uh, other care settings, there are the, the teams can get together and do what some people call a huddle or pre-visit evaluation. That just might be the provider looking at their charts ahead of time, but commonly it's a team-based activity. You know, the provider, the, the nursing clinical staff, care managers, if they have them in that practice. And at that morning huddle, they can go ahead and look at dashboards. Now, those dashboards, again, they might be at a different level, things that might highlight what the care team will need to do to prepare for the patient coming in or to be ready when the patient actually comes in to be alerted to something that's going to occur when they arrive. Maybe that patient showed us something as being overdue for something and the care team might need to go search that information out before the patient gets there. That way, when the patient arrives, their vision is much more comprehensive. And all of those gaps and things like that can be visualized in a huddle dashboard. One example, say Mr. Smith is coming in at 10 o'clock and uh, it, the dashboard shows that they're 
uh, he didn't have an eye exam for a while. Maybe I do eye exams in my office <clears throat> as a family doctor. I have a machine that takes a retinal scan or something like that. We can prepare for that. We can make sure that's available. So everything's ready to go. So the huddle team can check all those things out. And, uh, they have a Mr. Smith level dashboard and all of those things show up then uh, to prepare for that. After um, that huddle uh, activity, if we do that, if I have a chance, I might just go ahead and look at the dashboards before I go into a room again. I have a minute you know, or, or two at the most in between patients. So a nice salient view to help highlight the things I need to look at are going to make my visit with that patient a lot more smooth. So I'm not sitting and staring at the screen and looking for information while the patient has nothing better to do. It's very awkward when you do that. It happens all the time and it's awkward, but if anything we can do to avoid that um, is best. Um, so if the patient has like five chronic conditions and maybe only one of them is showing a gap or risk, I don't necessarily, except to say, how are you doing with these certain things? I don't need to review things for those other conditions the computer does a good job in telling me everything's okay and up to date, and that's good. I'm done. I don't need to worry about those things. Immediate, actionable information right there in the dashboard is great. If a patient's overdue for something, needs a med dose increase or something like that, it's best for me to do it right there. And then lastly, as you were mentioning, you know, we talked about that patient view. So we talked about the patient being access, being able to access it on the portal, but it's still really a wonderful thing. And I get so excited when I can share things with the patient right on the screen. There's a lot of different methodology to how you use a computer with a patient in the room. The best way to do it is so that the physician or provider and the patient can both see the screen and share all that information together. And then for me, be able to point to the patient, those graphs and those visualizations might be a little bit different than what they're seeing at home, but that is a much more efficient and um, connected way of getting with the patient. There's a lot of talk about the shared decision-making. So a lot of decisions that we have to make where providers would look at a guideline and say, we have to do this and this for this disease. Because the data is not as clear as we always like to pretend it would be, we talk about shared decision-making. Let's talk with the patient and say, Here's the information. Here's what we know. You know, let's talk about what's best for you in your situation. Everybody's different. But being able to share those clinical trends gives them a much better view of the information that they need to be able to help make those decisions. They're not, you know, trained medically, but they can now see what's going on. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what, what you raise really is the opportunity to use a dashboard to really focus the time between the provider and the patient, get the greatest value out of that short, direct interaction. Um, and I imagine that circumstance that you might need to balance out what kind of information doesn't need to be in that dashboard and might indeed be just confusing or clutter up the screen and the workflow. Maybe speak a little bit about, uh, from your own perspective, what you've seen in that regard. What What's extraneous? What doesn't need to be there? That's a really, really great question, too. I mean, we are definitely in a world of data overload and hardly any place more more than medicine. So a lot of people would say that a provider won't need uh, or want to see, say, normal things, normal values. If I know a test was done, a test was done, and let the computer only show me things that are abnormal so as not to distract me. If thing, If a bunch of items are up to date, I need to trust that it was up to date and not to see necessarily every detail. So if a dashboard includes health maintenance items like you know, your colonoscopy, the pneumonia shot, and so on, some dashboards might want to show all of the information, show the date they were done, and then maybe an indicator as to whether or not something's due or overdue. But that's still a lot of data. I mean, we've been talking about so much other data looking at one screen. That's another 10 items that really will not make any difference in the patient care. So maybe the, that dashboard just needs to show only things that are, are due or overdue, and we trust the rest. Show me only things that, that are truly needed, and maybe just give me a gold star or something like that if everything's up to date. But I don't need to see every detail about things that there's no decision to be made on. 
other things we don't need to see. Well, there's a lot of patient provided data that's going on right now. Patients doing home glucose readings. I've seen advertised on TV, just any any person with diabetes can tap their arm and send their diabetes, you know, their glucose reading off the doctor. Well, I don't know if I need to see all of those or home blood pressure readings. There's always decisions regarding how to integrate that data with other data sources especially at the dashboard level, but let the dashboard maybe show a highlight or a summary or something like that so that the providers don't need to go into all the individual data and analyze it. And probably the compromise of what should and shouldn't show is reached with um, like a more more dynamic dashboards than static ones. So screens that allow me to show that that high level, I don't know, the glucose is doing okay. Okay, I want to know a little bit more. The patient's telling me they're having a symptom. Give me a click and let me drill down into information and drill down. And that dynamic view then doesn't compromise the information at my fingertips, but allows kind of the high level and the detailed views as needed. Yeah. So, Doctor, let's let's take that concept of being able to drill down and understand that there might be more valuable data underneath that kind of top level. And, and go into the realm of customization. What should we standardize? What should we allow in terms of customization? You know, not all clinical practice is the same. We certainly have specialists that want to go deep within certain areas. Each patient, of course, is going to present with their own unique set of needs and problems. So how can we best balance those two opposing forces around standardization and customization and give the user the right controls? Yeah, that that's really good to know. Uh, maybe ten years we'll have a lot more information about that. But from a data standpoint, I think the jury's still out on what is best to show. So my my personal approach and the way we approach a lot of other things in EHR design is to not force, not prohibit behavior until there's overwhelming data that shows at least some sort of established standard that doesn't, as far as I can see, that doesn't exist yet today. As an example, if an EHR shows, let's say, um, patient allergy information, an individual user, when you talk about customizations, I can, lots of times individual users can turn on and off things. They probably shouldn't be allowed to turn off allergy information, you know? So there's probably some you know, minimal basement types of stuff outside of that. We, we try to allow as much freedom until we know from a study standpoint, you know, what definitely, you know, is in the patient's best interests. From a dashboard standpoint, then there is some indication that there may be improved outcomes or at least adherence to guidelines and some indication that they may prevent burnout, but there, there's still a lot of work to be done on the research side. And that's just at the macro level, just saying that if you use a dashboard, maybe there's a better outcome. As far as um, specific dashboard elements that do uh, or do not help achieve a certain goal or outcome, again, I, there's not a lot of data on that yet. But as with many types of configurations, as you were saying, um, I think it makes sense for there to be practice level and user levels of configuration. So let a practice define a default view and maybe even define required elements that they, they think might be necessarily allow or disallow users to turn them on or off. Maybe there are some outcomes that are specific to business needs there. A few years ago, I worked for an accountable care. Well, I worked for a large healthcare organization. They had an ACO. It's back when ACOs were young. And the ACO had slightly different outcomes that they were looking for, nothing out of standard or anything like that. It's just, that's where their business focused on. So that practices involved there might will have a different required view of a dashboard than um, practices that were outside of the ACO. But what I think is key as we try to answer questions like the one you asked is that EHRs and practices provide tools to measure what the users are doing and maybe even ways to correlate those choices with the outcomes that they're looking for. This then provides the data that will help to answer the questions you're looking for. We don't have it, but by having large numbers of people using dashboards and, and knowing what they're clicking on and what data they're using, and then looking at the patient's outcomes, we'll be able to accumulate that data better in the future. Mm -hmm. 
you know, you're you're raising the example of an accountable care organization is an interesting one because the reality is ambulatory practice have a lot of considerations to survive and thrive in today's world of how medical care is provided in the United States. So there are additional beyond just that realm of clinical and clinical practice and is the patient doing well. There's a whole variety of other financial and operational data that practices may need to consider uh, in reviewing in addition to their clinical elements. Um, speak a little bit about your your uh, research and what you found are important indicators to track in that domain. Information usually improves outcomes. So people know more about what's going on with the patients and with the processes. If you want docs to, say, demonstrate better diabetes outcomes or have a lower cost of care or have higher billing metric, that data needs to be transparent to the doctors, not just hidden hidden behind something and just telling them they're not performing. The more that information they see as time goes by, they tend to be pretty smart people and they can figure out what's going on. Let them compare things, their, their own data to peers, usually anonymously. Let them compare to, to local and national benchmarks so that there's good justification for any changes that need to be made. And I think it's really important to treat the doctors as partners in efforts to improve those things, not as subjects, not telling them what to do, but incorporate them into all these performance improvement and process improvement projects. Why are specific goals and metrics and reward mechanisms in place? Maybe they don't make sense. Sometimes specific goals and metrics reward the wrong thing. And people that are not treating patients don't know that. They're not malintentioned. They just don't know what's going to happen when they put a metric in place. So I think a lot of docs may want to be assured that their employer or the payer models don't interfere with and that uh, that, that they actually enhance patient care and outcomes. So we're almost out of time. Final question here. What are some of the the do's and the don'ts then for for creating really successful tools and dashboard solutions in the space? That's a great question. Um, I think I have to answer with a kind of a trite thing and uh, I'll use the term um, primum non nocere. First, do no harm. People hear that about doctors all the time. And I think that holds in this as well. There's at least a couple of harms that can probably come upon a, come up when uh, dashboards are created and used. As an example, the part of the dashboard I described earlier that shows gaps in care or stuff a patient might be due for remains a great idea, but it better be correct. So if we're telling docs, you can save time from looking over the whole chart and just worry about what's showing up in the dashboard, then find that that dashboard is missing something, then we end up with a worse outcome. So as with all advanced DHR functionality, a complex dashboard requires painstaking, multidisciplinary analysis, assuring all perspectives are represented, proactive risk analysis, user-centered design, extensive quality testing, alpha beta testing, and so on to make sure we're getting it right and not increasing the risk. I think it's worth mentioning that there was a recent study and literature review published in the Journal of the American Medical Informatics Association that looked at the usability of a public health dashboard. They were looking specifically at some dashboards that were created for looking at uh, sexually transmitted infections from a public health standpoint. So it's definitely worth looking at that type of thing. And as one of the products of this paper, they did usability checklists that can be applied to dashboard designers. But anyway, overall findings of this paper, and they looked at a bunch of different dashboards, show that based on their checklist, that usability checklist, um, which is also based on its own literature review of visual analytics, over 30% of these STI dashboards had major usability problems in the areas of understandability and scientific integrity and accessibility. And several other major areas were listed. So a ton of resources went into uh, developing these dashboards. A lot of money went into this development. And probably they don't have a ton of buy-in because they're not trustworthy based on all these findings. But the big picture, I think, because there's not yet a ton of data that, as we discussed earlier, to say what definitely does or does not work, we just count on our iterative design 
implementation and that continuous improvement uh, principles. And um, I think if we use those, we'll have a much better outcome. Be ready to demonstrate and prove your case. If you have dashboards that you want to implement, have data that support it. Dashboards are hard, like we said before. They're expensive and they're potentially high risk. So sure you have the tools, the data, the reports, and the uh, backing to demonstrate what does and does not work. Excellent. Well, Dr. Gill, thank you so much for joining me on this topic today. Really appreciate you sharing your uh, thoughts and your insights in this domain. Uh, thank you for our listeners for tuning in. This is Graham Brown with NextGen Healthcare. Thanks for joining us and have a great day. Thanks for listening to the Ambulatory Healthcare Today podcast hosted by the NextGen Advisors. Never miss an episode by subscribing at nextgen.com slash podcast. To see a list of products and services tailored for ambulatory care practices, visit nextgen.com.